Uh, our keynote speaker is Gerardo Hertes. Um, and his title of his presentation is uh, Climate Change, the Expanding Bullseye Effect of Disasters and Farm Animals. Um, it's a privilege to have Gerardo with us today, and he's just setting up his slides now. Um, Again, uh, just a, a few pieces of standard information before we start. So the Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have any questions, please ask those in the Q&A feature. I will endeavor to ask those at the end of the session. So Gerardo will have about 30 minutes to speak and we hopefully will have five, 10 minutes of questions at the end of the session. Uh, again, you know about the closed captions, so please take advantage of that function if you need it. Um, if you are on Twitter or X, as I think we're now calling it, um, we encourage you to at least let the rest of the world know that we're here and that we're working to uh, help animals and people in disasters. So please use the hashtag GADMACONF, so G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F, um, for your Twitter and social media. And you'll also uh, probably be given a short evaluation at the end of the session, or certainly will be by the time you get underway properly. And just uh, as a reminder, the video recordings will be made, but there will be a delay. OK, so now I would like to start the uh, first keynote speaker of our presentation uh, today. And uh, over to you, Gerardo, please. Thank you, Mel. And greetings from Costa Rica. A storm is coming, so if you hear some thundering, it's part of the uh, ambience for this conference. You may be thinking, however, what else is there to learn about climate change that I haven't already heard? After all, it's all bad news. This article, oh, this presentation seeks to examine and start the discussion on the effect of climate change and the policies needed to mitigate its effects on farm animals, but from a proactive perspective for a change. The narrative on climate change has been nominated by ominous forecasts and scenarios of destruction, with protests, large meetings, and dubious public pledges and promises. Many young people suffer nowadays of a syndrome called climate anxiety due to the complexity and the apparent titanic size of the challenge. Not even the ultimate experts on global warming, the IPCC, or International Panel on Climate Change, have been able to agree on how will these scenarios really unfold. Probably due to its high complexity, the climate narrative has picked up the worst words and held on to them. Climate modeling and IPCC reports are complex to predict, and the scenarios have for the most part neglected human ingenuity resourcefulness and inventivity as a big as big mitigation factors to offset uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So basically, we are uh, faced with the idioms as the key block concepts in the discussion. Climate, sorry about that. Climate change and weather are used in different ways to describe similar ideas. A few initial concepts uh, to help us understand first. What is climate? Climate uh, is defined as the oceanic and atmospheric circulation uh, and redistributing of heat and moisture around the world uh, on a global system. And it's affected by the interaction between the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere. It, you can read the rest, uh, but it, it's also influenced by human factors uh, more recently and the sun. This is interesting to, um, to help us understand that we are not into a linear <coughs> path here. Now, this, is, this graphic shows you climate stability for the last 10,000 years. It's important to understand that the variances uh, in this period of time have not changed more than half a, a degree centigrade. And that has helped um, humankind and its uh, farm and domestic animals flourish and multiply. Uh, this uh, small changes uh, are affected um, are affected by the orbit uh, in relationship with the sun. But the, most of this uncertainty comes obviously from nature. This this 
these variances in, in climate. The climate system is, quote, a coupled nonlinear chaotic system. That is uh, very fancy words to say, this is so difficult, we hardly understand it. And therefore the long-term predictions of future climate states, it's impossible. Only scenarios, only distinctive scenarios and short-term predictions are possible. But no one knows which scenario will be. All, uh, all we know is what can we do about it and what our input may be. This is, uh, this is interesting. I wanna show you, however, <clears throat> how does this looks uh, in real time in my country. This happened uh, last month here in Costa Rica. So there you go. It's, uh, it's easier said than done or than uh, accepting the, uh, the, uh, the consequences. Um, after much supercomputing, by the way, uh, uh, on, on scenarios, uh, the SSPs were developed or shared socio-economical pathways for the UN's, um, the UN's uh, plan to, uh, to tackle climate change. These are five different scenarios uh, of development that uh, the world should, should follow to, uh, to tackle climate change. And we will see how uh, do they um, interact with, uh, with animals in general. The number five, diffusive fuel development seems to be, uh, you know, first knee-jerk reaction seems to be the, the, the wrong one uh, to, to follow, but it's actually the, the other way around. Here's an index of what we're going to be discussing today. First of all, just allow me to say that the imprint, uh, the human and farm animal imprint on climate change is significant, but still unclear. So we really do not know, despite of everything you hear <clears throat> and read, how is it uh, affecting in, in the long run and in the final equation, the change in climate uh, worldwide. But anyway, the index uh, we're going to be discussing today is a different angle to look at this interaction between climate and animals. The, uh, the new uh, notion of the expanding bullseye effect, a cautionary tale for animals, a few issues about policies, impact, disruption, uh, spread of disease, and more impact, and solutions. That's probably the uh, more interesting bit of, of this conversation. So a different approach to climate change. Here's a quote, climbs of devastation are almost entirely unwarranted and can lead to wasteful climate policies. What does this mean? It means that <clears throat> uh, the uh, scientific community has not agreed yet on what the, um, the negative effects of, uh, of this change will have on, on human activity. And uh, if we decide to, uh, to uh, invest money and effort and time in the wrong policies and the wrong approaches, we may uh, throw away a lot of money, put the accelerator, the foot on the, on the wrong accelerator and, uh, and devastate or even eradicate trillions and trillions of dollars that could otherwise uh, go into welfare and, all, and um, into uh, mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, this, this pie chart here is probably the most interesting to me here. Um, the, Paris, the Paris Agreement, you might have heard of this, uh, a decision by all the countries uh, around the world <clears throat> to reduce the, uh, the production of carbon dioxide, at best can get rid of 64 gigatons. And that amounts to 1% of the necessary reduction of carbon dioxide. So all the money that uh, all the countries in the world have pledged to reduce carbon dioxide by you know, uh, reducing their, their outputs on their industry and activity uh, can only amount to 1%. So imagine what kind of impact will re would that really have on the uh, change in climate? I'm not going to be 
doing uh, this book a particular publicity, but I um, invite you to read it because it's interesting and uh, it's probably the foundation of this discussion. So this is the expanding bullseye effect. The impact of disasters will likely grow as more and more people and their wealth stand in the path of danger. What does that mean? And the, here's the uh, hypothetical picture of a flood impacting a city. Um, the city grows as uh, the numbers of people grow. Their assets, including uh, farm animals and of course domestic animals as well, grow. And it just enlarges the, bulls, the, bull, the bullseye until uh, more and more wealth is affected by the same type of disasters. So it's not the flood necessarily that is growing. The floodplains have always been there. It's just that human encroachment and their activities end up in those floodplains and uh, become uh, more vulnerable, of course. This is how the expanding bullseye effect would look on livestock. Um, 50 years ago, a few cattle would be would be in the, in in harm's way, and nowadays it's just more of them: cattle, uh, chicken, of course, pigs, any farm animals uh, you might get you you may think of. Especially because if you think of the uh, bullseye, the red circle as uh, the place where most people live, um, farm animals usually live um, around them on the outskirts. But anyway. The good Dr. Lombard uh, focused his preposition on um, on, anim on humans, excuse me. Uh, he says human welfare will lead to prosperity, which in turn will lead to innovation, which in turn would, will lead to adaptation for climate change, of course, and finally arrive to resilience. That is his bet. The trouble is that uh, farm animals are essential essential assets to food security and livelihoods. And um, as humans grow, uh, these animals will also grow. But we need to find a few parallelisms in this business of animal welfare, um, if there are any to follow humans. Now here is the cautionary tale for animals. An ever-growing prosperous human population means an ever-growing consumer base demanding more animal protein. And we know that is the case. The more people come out of poverty, the more meat they want to cons consume and the more dairy products. Uh, it's been almost a law of nature in, develop in the developing world. So this means more pressure, more exposure, more vulnerability uh, to growing and intensive farm animal production uh, businesses. So maybe what's good for the uh, humans may not be so good for the animals if we don't understand how the, um, the, the, the cautionary tale goes. And here comes the, uh, the gist of the problem, climate change mitigation policies. What does that mean? It means that countries are spending money left, right, and center trying to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. You've seen now how the US is preparing to spend uh, a lot of money into the new heat wave that is hitting um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, at least 100 million people. And the same is happening in other continents. And uh, they will have to do something about it. But so far, the um, cost benefit of these investments has not been uh, good enough. Crucial, and this is crucial to the success of mitigation and adaptation strategies. Current, uh, like I said, mitigation policies offer low value for the money. And uh, we need to look at this when we uh, uh, plan also for the animals. The impact of climate change and animal welfare um, and its health starts with habitat transformation. Pastures will change, temperature will change, and new um, disease vectors will come in. The physiological changes that the above issues are going to bring will no doubt affect the uh, production 
and the performance of these animals. And uh, if, if, uh, if that would not be enough, power shortages in the case of intensive uh, poultry farms and pig farms um, can actually kill um, hundreds of thousands of animals at a time. And we've seen that happen in many countries, including Brazil and the US. And in this case, uh, or in the case of my country, which where we have a lot of dairy cattle, mill production uh, is gonna be affected. And with that, the economy of that industry. And uh, higher temperatures is already bringing shrubbery uh, that invades pastures and complicates nutrition. And the ticks uh, that are bringing Lyme disease and other um, uh, problems are everywhere now. And uh, these particular uh, races of uh, cattle are not, are not uh, strong enough to, um, to handle these issues. That's probably the first thing that needs to be done is to start looking for, uh, for more resistant um, types of animals. Anyway, uh, I wanted to share with you an example of, uh, of in South America, we had a project a few years ago in the Bolivian highlands. That is above 5,000 meters of altitude, hard to breathe, uh, let alone uh, eat or survive because there is very little uh, to eat. But anyway, just by changing a slight change in the, um, in, in the weather there and the, uh, the temperature brought about mosquitoes carrying malaria which uh, was something that they had, had never heard of for the last 400 years, and uh, probably more. We, they just didn't keep, uh, didn't keep any, any more records. Um, and that is, that is uh, something that is going to happen, whether we like it or not, it's happening already. And uh, here at the bottom, you can see uh, the talk of the town before COVID-19 hit us, before the pandemic, hit uh, the world, uh, the World Health Organization and, um, and OIE, which is now stands uh, with a different, different name, uh, identified antimicrobial resistance and avi avian flu as the biggest threats uh, humanity was going to have. And uh, the pandemic didn't, they didn't, didn't put them away. They are still there. So uh, these issues are no small ones. But let's move on to the economic impact on livelihoods. Um, prosperity, when it's affected, public health and social security ends up in criminality. And we're seeing that all over the place, especially and more um, hurtful in Central America. Um, the concatenated economic consequences means that every level, every layer in the economy starting with the dairy cattle I just showed you, up to the guys that make the, um, the, um, the cheese and the supermarkets that sell it and so forth uh, are going to suffer and uh, probably end up in bankruptcy. And the banking and the insurance sector disruptions, um, what a better example that uh, Florida now, uh, the state of Florida in the US, in which one of the biggest uh, insurance companies is pulling out uh, of that um, state and no longer offering insurance to um, households that uh, basically take a hurricane every year. So um, we can see the, the concatenation of uh, consequences. So solution, I'm not going to, uh, you, you shouldn't worry about that many solutions. It's just a, an interesting discussion, I think. A lot of NGOs are championing uh, the reduction of meat consumption, that easy. It's easier said than done because as I said, humankind uh, relates, um, relates prosperity with meat consumption in many cases. But um, in those, for those of us that are more uh, fortunate, um, we can still, um, contemplate uh, the reduction of meat consumption, not only for ethical reasons, we're seeing what the, uh, the footprint may be, but also um, for uh, health reasons. The second is the capacity building of target audiences. Uh, one of the most important audiences to me are the veterinary sector, not necessarily 
uh, trained on disaster management or uh, the uh, relationship between disasters, animals, and climate change, and the needs for adaptation and, um, and mitigation. So this is important. And uh, I'm talking about uh, veterinarians all over the world. And also, um, I would um, put as a second um, audience, the civil defense departments. They do not know anything, or they know very little about animals. And uh, they need to start talking to each other, especially to the veterinarians. So uh, there is a new tool that I go, I'm going to be presented, presenting on another uh, time in this, during this conference called Visualization of Future Scenarios. And basically, it's, um, it's a tool that uh, takes advantage of the, uh, the new era of, uh, of cellular phones and uh, virtual reality. And it helps uh, create capacity without the difficulties of drills and simulations that are uh, just as good, but very expensive and very um, narrow in in the amount of people they can they can reach at a time. And uh, we are running out of time, and we need to start thinking about all all the farmers uh, and all the veterinarians and all the civil defense uh, officials we need to reach, including even um, uh, local governments. But anyway, let's move to this to the, the next one. A good cost benefit analysis of every adaptation measures governments and local governments um, undertake, including infrastructure reinforcement. That is paramount. If you don't have a positive cost benefit analysis or result for the measures you're about to take, you're probably wasting money and uh, probably getting you in, a, in an even worse position. Early warning systems. That is now the talk of the town for the UN around the world with the communities. And it's very simple actually to, um, to adapt early existing war, uh, warning systems, early warning systems for animals. They just need to to be aware that uh, the animals may need to evacuate earlier or they need to have a plan B. They can't just go with humans because you know physically that might not be possible, especially farm animals. So um, an interesting conversation altogether. Um, as I showed you about my antimicrobial resistance, uh, the, uh, the forecasts a few years ago, we need stronger health protocols. And that is that that goes without saying. Uh, the pandemic was not the last pandemic, and we need to uh, we need to uh, be aware of that. Coordination of all the targets, uh, audiences I mentioned before, with civil defense is a must. Otherwise, they're they're not going to be able to learn that many tricks. And the insurance uh, sector needs to start developing technical support for their clients. They just they should, they're, they're there to make money, of course, it's a business, but they could uh, participate in the, um, in the capacity building uh, process because they're closer and because they can monetize every argument. And uh, at the end of the day, that might be a good thing. Um, and so forth, obviously, we need to invest in research. That is the basis of the argument of Dr. Lomborg that we're going to be coming up with new ideas for adaptation and mitigation and that doesn't uh, uh, get done without investment and uh, the big governments need to start looking at their roads and bridges and every infrastructure that is vital to the economy um, to reach uh, farms and to reach markets etc so as you see this is a lot uh, to chew on and i in an article uh, published uh, earlier um, on LinkedIn, the recommendation, as usual, with any uh, with any uh, risk plan or risk map, is to take a couple of at a time and then recycle and take the new ones. I want to show you um, what I'm talking about uh, when uh, when we discuss uh, here. These are chicken. Uh, after a typhoon in the Philippines. They're just sitting there waiting to die because of the sun. 
and because of the inability of the uh, owner to um, give him, even, even give them even water. Uh, the problem with that owner, if that's, that wouldn't be enough to you, is that he was uh, unable to uh, pay his, the loans that he took to get those chicken. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle or circle that only uh, brings about a lot of suffering for those animals and a lot of suffering for the owners of those animals. Gerardo, your um, your your links yes. aren't actually showing us anything, so we don't see anything when you click. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure if you can change the presentation or 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 just describe what we would be seeing, perhaps. What happened? Uh, what 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 did go wrong, Mel? Uh, we we don't see or hear anything. Oh, really? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I thought I thought you were looking at the same thing. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, I was hoping I was looking at the videos and you were not. This is um, this is an in, uh, uh, an argument about the factors that affect farm animals, uh, especially intensive farm animals. Um, the, the, their resilience to disasters. There are intrinsic factors, extrinsic environmental factors systemic factors, et cetera. And uh, you can find it in that book over there, but it's interesting to understand what are the, um, the, uh, the steps and what are the priorities to take um, to, um, to, to build resilience for farm animals. So coming, down, coming up to, uh, to the end, and uh, apologies again for not looking at the videos. I was looking at them and enjoying them, sorry. Uh, the expanding bullseye effect gives us a better picture or perspective of uh, why is it that more and more people and their animals are getting into harm's way, not necessarily because there are more or bigger disasters. Yep. And that gives, uh, gives us a perspective to look at the bottom uh, line here. Smart cost benefit climate change policies are a must for our societies to survive. Uh, because if we spend money in the wrong place, we're going to be taking that money because money is not infinite from somewhere else, probably from education or welfare uh, of humans. And they are the ones called, we are the ones called to find mitigation and adaptation uh, propositions. Like this good doctor says, if we focus too much on global warming, we're likely to miss important investments to ensure we avoid the worst climate change scenarios. Um, last month, again, in Bangkok, the UN held a regional meeting uh, on the advanced resilience planning using disaster resilience scorecards for cities. That, that's uh, a new tool. But nowhere were animals um, represented here, and that needs to change. It can be done, it must be done. Climate change is not going to fix itself. Of course, this is just scratching the surface. Um, there's a lot to discuss about this, but I hope um, this starts the discussion. Thank you. All set. Mel, I can't hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, you're not hearing from me. We're not seeing from Gerardo. This is not uh, not going perhaps as swimmingly as we hoped it might do, but hopefully you'll uh, you'll all bear with us here. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Gerardo. I was so relieved when you hit the solutions slide and there was more than one or indeed there was at least something because it's easy to feel very um, overwhelmed with the complexity and the interconnectedness of all these aspects, as you as you so you know, uh, clearly told us, um, we have probably about five minutes for questions. So if anybody has questions, please put those into the Q and A box. Um, in the meantime, uh, Gerardo, I'm when I when we speak about climate change, my thoughts um, always go to our children and the future. And I guess you, you touch on that a bit with the education comments you made. And I just wondered if you were aware of any um, any good uh, approaches that are being taken to, I guess, support the children in thinking about about 
climate change, but, but more broadly climate change and the animal sort of impacts? Yeah, um, you, you may remember I mentioned the anxiety uh, the youth is suffering right now from, just because the, um, the problem seems so big, so, uh, so unsurmountable uh, that it's, the, the solution is to blame the uh, adults, the older guys that are not doing enough. Um, the, I'm not trying to defend anyone, uh, but there is a finite amount of money that governments need to uh, allocate to different needs. And climate change seems to be the place where everybody should throw money and wait for that 1%. If you remember that pie chart, that is so uh, disheartening. Uh, all the money in the world needs to, uh, to, to be directed to, for that 1%. That's not enough. That's not going to help our future generations. So we need to be more, uh, more innovative and more clever about that. I think the, uh, the youth uh, needs to see this not, not as a mountain to climb, but as a problem that needs a lot of innovation and um, smarts. Um, <clears throat> and it involves uh, all kinds of people, not just climate experts, but also economists. And in the case of uh, farm animals, veterinarians. So everybody has a, a job to do here. And if you start by saying, yeah, this, this can be done um, and uh, we can do it rather than this is impossible, we're gonna die. There is nothing in the future for us. We shouldn't have any children or do anything because we're gonna die anyway. That doesn't help. And um, um, the uh, proposition to, uh, to take a path of development and welfare for humans needs to be readjusted or adjusted to, to, uh, to animals as well, because otherwise we're just going to put pressure on them uh, to, uh, to feed an ever-growing population of uh, humans. So I think there is a little light uh, of hope uh, with this new uh, uh, approach. The article explains uh, more details about it. You, you can't speak about it uh, in half an hour. And the book is also a good, uh, a good place uh, to look for, for hope. So um, yes, there, there have been examples of, about this in the, uh, at the community level, and uh, but they are disconnected from the discussion because um, the discussion in, in big cities is about uh, children or, or school children or students trying to force the government to throw more money at this. And uh, the, the cautionary tale of <laughs> um, beyond the, the one for animals is that we need to be really, really savvy uh, and really careful about the investment uh, to help us uh, thrive and then come up with, with uh, clever solutions. Yeah, I think limited budgets and limited um, motivation to see beyond the immediate sort of period or the term of government, whatever the, the issues are, 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 are stifling some of the more creative and Inter um, connected sort of approaches that could be taken. I think um, we've still got a couple of minutes for questions. I haven't had anything come up in the Q and A, um, so I don't know if there's anything more that either you would like to say, Gerardo. I know we're looking forward to your visualizations presentation that you mentioned. That sounds like it's going to be really interesting, and I might have to wake up in the middle of the night to uh, to listen to that one. 